Welcome back. Uh, this time we're going to talk about market strength, which is more talking about market breadth um, and that type of analysis. So it's another form of consensus type indicator, but this time looking at the constituents or the members um, of an index. So you could look at the members of the SP500, the 500 shares or 505 as it is right now, um, shares that make up the S&P 500 and say, well, what can we glean from what's happening to all of them together as a group? Or maybe it's all the shares on the NYSE. So there are a couple of common groups uh, can do this on any index around the world or any stock market around the world. So let's jump in and have a look at market breadth. So the, the idea of breadth, the most simplest form is the advanced decline, which I think we talk about in a couple of slides. Essentially what we're doing is we're looking every day and we're taking all of the stocks in the NYSE, for instance, and saying how many of those stocks um, closed higher than what they were yesterday. We count that and that they're our advances. So we sum up how many that is. Then we take how many uh, actually close lower and they're our decliners. And then we can just take a subtraction between the two. The advances subtract the decliners, and that is our simple breadth measure. Uh, and so what we're looking for is confirmation. So when we have, let's say, the S&P 500 um, and it's rising, um, we want to know that it's well supported across the whole market. Uh, and so that's why we want to see our breadth measure rising as well. Now, we talked about this, um, I think, earlier on, where when you get to the end of a trend and the public's coming in, the public typically buys into the big household names. You know, they're, they're not buying the smaller, more obscure companies. Um, it's, it's the big ones. You know, Intel will always do better than AMD uh, at the end of a, of a trend because everyone knows Intel. Not so many people know AMD. So. Um, that's one thing that we watch for. Now, when you get that situation where there's only a handful of really large capitalized companies that are rising and they're pulling up the S&P 500 with it, but the majority of smaller cap or the smaller companies are falling away, then that tells us that there's weakness in the market. Uh, and quite often that happens around market tops. Um, Often this relationship we present it as a percentage. Often, again, we're looking for these divergences. We'll talk a lot more about divergences in this session. Um, an increase in index while more constituents are declining should generate concern that the increase is poorly supported. And so we've got a bit of a table there, again, very similar to what we've done with volume before uh, and a lot of our oscillators as well. When you see that the breadth is rising and price is rising, you'd say the breadth is confirming the price rise. When the breadth is falling and the price is falling, then breadth is confirming the price drop. But when you see breadth falling but price rising, then you've got divergence, negative divergence, and breadth does not support what's happening in the price of the index there. Uh, and then it, obviously the, the um, uh, converse there, when breadth is rising um, but the price is falling, it's showing that breadth doesn't confirm the price drop. And again, both those cases, we would expect a reversal to be imminent. So at market tops, many tops are preceded by negative divergence in the, the breadth with the, uh, the AD line, the advanced decline line. Um, first document in 1926 uh, by Colonel Leonard Ayres. Uh, he was the first one to pick it and write about this on a quite regular basis. He was looking at the constituents uh, in the market and, and counting how many were going up and down and was having great success doing that. Um, you can get tops without divergence. So whilst negative divergence at the top is a very clear sign that a top's about to be put in, you can get a top that doesn't show divergence. So it's not that you must have both. Um, so again, just to confirm divergence and confirmation, uh, we have this, uh, these cases here. So this example here, we would call um, bearish or negative divergence. Uh, this one here would be bullish or positive divergence. So in these cases, it's the indicator's perspective. The indicator is showing us that what our expectation is, is positive. We're expecting a, a bullish outcome for the market, um, you know, and it's not based on price. Uh, confirmation again, 
we would call this bullish confirmation. The, um, the breadth measure is confirming what we're seeing in price. And then here is bearish confirmation. The, um, the breadth measure is confirming what we're seeing in price there as well. Now there's another example, James Hughes talked about this in the 1930s where he'd require double um, divergence. So it's almost like a conf confirmation there. And what he would wanna see is this double positive or double negative. So we have our first divergence at this point where price is going up but the breadth is going down and then it continues on. We had another one higher uh, and then we get uh, another one lower here, and so it's double divergence. Look, as with all indicators and, and things like this, when you put that extra requirement on, yes, your results are going to be better, you're going to be more accurate, but you're going to be slower into the trade, um, and you may miss opportunities that only had one um, divergence uh, prior to that. So always a really fine line. You've got to test these things for yourself as you go as well. So advances versus decliners, that's the example I, I talked about right at the top there. Counting the advances, subtracting the decliners, creating an oscillator out of that. Uh, then we have the advanced decline index, uh, which is accumulating. So we're adding up all those values or subtracting uh, and creating a line like that. Again, the value is meaningless. Uh, it is just the relationship to price that we're most interested in. Um, then we have a average on that AD line and down the bottom, what we did is we took a ratio between the, the advanced decline and the simple moving average. Um, and you know again, there's some really nice, interesting signals that can be derived out of that. Ned Davis Research did a lot of work with this, um, comparing the AD index to its um, moving average. And basically what they found, now this is starting at 100, so above one, 104, um, had 19.3% annual return when the market was over 104. Um, and then when that measure dropped below 0.97, it had 11.2% annual losses on average. So some nice research there confirming it. Um, what we've got there, the green shaded area, is where the market is above uh, that, that moving average threshold there. Um, and so it's very interesting and they're not selling until it goes below uh, the lower threshold. Uh, so some nice trades there uh, based on that. All right, so just a quick little table of some of the breadth measures. We're gonna go through some of these in the next few slides. Um, advanced decline line, simply counting the advances, subtracting advanced decline index, we're accumulating it. We've got the McLennan oscillator, which does a great job of taking the AD concept and uh, doing two moving averages and doing an oscillator. We'll talk about that in a moment. Summation index, again, it's an accumulation. So you see this pattern over and over and over again that we talk about. Plurality index, looking at the absolute sum um, over 25 days, absolute breadth measure. Uh, and again, we'll talk about these unchanged issues. So remember with the advanced declines, we looked at those whose closes were up and they were our advances those whose closes were down, and they were our decliners, but there's a group in the middle where they're closing at the exact same level where they were yesterday. Well, they're our unchanged group. And so, you know, there's a ratio of the unchanged group to the total number of stocks. Um, and so there's some interesting things out of that as well. The advanced decline ratio divides the advances by the decliners. There's so many ways that we slice and dice this information, um, and new highs and new lows. Uh, looking at how many stocks are at their yearly highs or within, you know, making new highs or maybe within a couple of percent of their new highs. Um, how many stocks are at their new, are making new lows? And looking at that ratio tells us a lot about the market. We'll go through that as well. So I just wanted to put that as a table for you. Again, you can print that out, use that as a sheet to um, review as you come into the exam um, and just help you remember what each of these are. So let's go to the McLennan Oscillator, um, developed in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, by Sherman McLennan. Um, it basically is looking back, so it's taking this AD period, uh, the AD Oscillator, looking back, putting on two exponential moving averages and taking an oscillation, an oscillator between them. Uh, and again, you know, we just look at the results here. So it's obviously easy to see in this 
large pivot here. So we've got our crossing of the zero line there. Um, you know, it's a very simple way of doing it and then staying in until we cross below. Uh, another way is to look at these zones. You know, so there's some zones that they set up and suggested and basically again crossing back into that middle zone, staying up and crossing down into there again. Could be great signals there. Um, the extreme re um, readings obviously on this one, so when you get these extreme peaks on the tools, that basically are giving you a pretty much like an overbought, oversold. It's basically telling you that, hang on, we're getting to a point where there's so many stocks uh, that are supporting this trend that our expectation could be that it's going to roll over because that's unsustainable. It doesn't happen like that in the history of the markets. We don't get these periods where everything is up at um, uh, on the positive side. There's got to be some sort of change. Uh, and again, you can use this for divergences as well. Uh, you know, a classic one that just jumps straight out is you look at these two peaks here uh, and then translate that up. We've got a peak here and we've got a peak there. Now, maybe negative divergence would be a little bit cruel to say at this point, um, but it's definitely not bullish confirmation going on there. Uh, you know, it's probably slightly down while that's heavily up. And so we've got a bit of divergence there. All right, so McLennan summation index, summing up those values. Uh, again, I've compressed the data a little bit. You can see there the oscillator in the middle and then the summation index underneath. Uh, and again, some really nice uh, signals coming out of that one too. So, you know, great tools for, for using. Um, jumping around to new highs and new lows. So taking that one, you know, it's a very important tool. Um, here, as I said, we're looking at those, how many stocks are near their all-time highs or their yearly highs, or maybe it's a smaller look back. There's different variants of this. Um, and then what we're looking at is that we want to be essentially, you know, when most stocks are, are taking new highs, that's where we want to be. So we want to buy when it's above zero uh, because more stocks are making new highs, and then we want to sell when it's below zero. And you can see we've just automatically put in the arrows there for those signals. Fantastic signal, especially coming down. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my wrong screen. Especially coming here uh, at the bottom. You know, so fast to respond. Uh, and then the market's making new, new highs um, coming out of that. So definitely a really important breadth measure. Uh, often questions asked about this one. Um, in the previous curriculum, there was a whole chapter dedicated to this. Now it's only a section within the chapter. So uh, I'm not sure that you're going to get asked as many questions, but definitely one of the better breadth measures. You do need to know this one very well. Another variant of that is stocks above their moving average. So again, what we're looking at is let's take a moving average of each stock. So we get each stock, put a moving average on it, is that, is that stock's price above its moving average or is it below? And that's the count that we make. Um, and so that then drives the, uh, the breadth measure. So here again, we've got the S&P 500. We've got the percentage of stocks in the S&P 500 that are above their 50-day moving average. Um, and, and instead of showing strength, what this one's really sort of um, can be used as is more an overbought, oversold. Um, so, you know, when you're getting down here and, and we're below 25%, you know, we're in an oversold um, condition. And you can see that, you know, it doesn't stay down there very long. You know, we get to those conditions and then it turns around and goes up. Now, when we're above 75%, then we're getting into an overbought type condition. And again, you can see the, the correlation there with market tops. Uh, as well. So another great one to look for and there's different variants, you know, 50 periods common, 200 periods common, I've seen 10 period as well. So there's all these different variants uh, that can be used. Now the 80-60 rule uh, with this is based on the idea of when the, the um, breadth measure has been above 80 and then comes down and declines below 60 then it has such a high probability of continuing on all the way down to 30. Uh, so that's you know a, a common one that that 
has been observed many times. You know, and so looking at it here, you, here we've just been probably just touched on above 80, crossed 360 and we went all the way down to the 30 line. Uh, this one didn't do it. As with everything in technical analysis, it doesn't always happen, but then here's another example where it did happen. So these, that's a, a rule that you need to be aware of. Volume and breadth, so you know everything we've done so far has just been on counting the number of issues. Um, and, and again, let me just highlight this as well. We talk about the equities. Now, so many texts and sometimes exams questions can talk about issues, the number of issues. It's just mean the number of equities or the number of companies. So just keep that in mind as well. But everything so far has been just purely on how many stocks have got a change up and a change down. What we're doing with volume is we're saying, well, instead of just taking the number of stocks, let's take all of their volume up. So what you can get then is a situation where maybe the 10 biggest companies are all going up and everything else is going slightly down, but the 10 biggest companies, because of the sheer volume, it still sends the breadth measure up. You know, whether that defeats the purpose of breadth is a discussion for another time, but nevertheless, there are some common measures that will take volume into the breadth calculation um, and, and use that as well. Uh, so the volume thrust oscillator is uh, an example. Um, having a break of around about one and a half um, and seeing that break through that line uh, is a bit of an indicator there that can be used. The arms index is probably the most popular, uh, also known as TRIN because that's the, the um, ticker symbol used on a few of the trading packages. Um, but essentially what we're looking there is taking a ratio between the number of advancing stocks versus the declining stocks and then also taking a ratio of the amount of volume that's advancing versus the declining volume. And that's the, the arms index or the trend value. Um, and again, it's just, it's very interesting. Um, you know, you, you can look through that chart and, and sort of see the different opportunities that um, can come from that. Uh, Brett Thrust is a, another one uh, written by Martin's Week. Uh, and again, it's taking a ratio of advances um, to the sum of the advances and decliners. So it's not the total because we're not including the unchanged, but it's the advances um, to the sum uh, of both of them and then smoothing it out. Um, and then looking for signals there based on excursions outside of the, um, the Bollinger Band again. So the Bollinger Band, we keep using this because it's such a simple way of doing a standard deviation over a look back period and then looking for excursions outside of those bands as extreme values um, being overbought, oversold and, and tight, things like that. This one's actually a little more interesting um, because it seems to be that it's not so much overbought but it is actually giving you signals on the breakouts um, there as well. So that's measuring market strength, a, a bit of a shorter session this time. Um, you need to be able to know all of those measures. You know, I've listed those measures there. Um, just knowing what they are, what they're trying to calculate will put you in great stead for the exam. Um, you need to explain the concept of advances and decliners. You need to explain what adding volume does and how that's done. Um, you need to recognise the basic signals in a lot of these, you know, and essentially it's the same thing over and over. We're either looking for extremes, we're looking for, you know, you can put a signal line on, those sorts of things. Um, basically the high, the new high, the new low, make sure you understand that. Make sure you understand the um, stocks over their 50-day moving averages. They're, they're important to know as well. Hope that helps. Uh, I think that wraps up lesson seven or lesson six. And so uh, we'll continue on next time. Thank you.